It is a pleasure to be here at the uh, REBA event. I really wanted to be here. Uh, I got into politics uh, having had a number of jobs running a business, uh, having been a lawyer for a while and being a steeplechase jockey. When I say that normally, as that lady just over there has just done, uh, they look at each other and say, surely he looks a bit fat to be a jockey. <laughs> it is true I have put on weight, and it wasn't cart horses, it was just normal horses. Uh, but it is the case that uh, for the last uh, seven years I've been the Member of Parliament for Hexham, and last year the Prime Minister asked me to be the Minister for Pensions, but more importantly she asked me to be the first Minister for Financial Inclusion. And it is a job that I wanted to do, and it is a privilege to do it, because it is an opportunity to have a genuine understanding both of the pensions importance to this country, but also that we are unequivocally supporting savings and investment on a long-term basis. Now, it is unquestionably the case that for a long period of time, uh, pensions have been in decline. This downward trend was long and spanned multitudes of governments. Uh, but we need, quite simply, to get the British people to fall in love, not only with pensions, but with savings and investment. To grasp clearly that having money put away gives you options, not only to own a home, as we're about to discuss later, but to change career, and more importantly, to survive life setbacks and the difficulties uh, that apply, and also to have a better standard of living in older age. I'm most definitely not here to be political. If you choose to vote for a bunch of unreconstructed Marxists, that's your choice. But I am here to make the case very strongly that the, uh, I believe that the long-term economic plan is showing real signs of progress. Uh, only today we see that the job situation has higher than ever before at 32.2 million. Unemployment is the lowest for 43 years. It's down from 4.7% down to 4.2%. Uh, the pound is the strongest currency in the G10. Investment is up, manufacturing up, is up. And we have wages increasing by approximately 2.8%. However, there is no question whatsoever that issues of savings on an ongoing basis and access to finance is a crucial issue. I want to start, though, by acknowledging the work of the various employers in the room, because you've worked very hard with government to make uh, organizations uh, work at uh, automatic enrollment. That has seen 9.5 million people. That's 9.5 million people who were not previously saving into a private pension, now saving as a result of automatic enrollment. And the government cannot do that on its own. It requires an employee, employer to assist. And I am uh, very much encouraged by the evidence from the living wage campaign that shows that where employers truly value, engage, and appreciate their employees, the evidence is overwhelming that output and productivity rise, staff retention uh, improves, and staff happiness, mental well-being, and the view they have of the company that they're working for and that the brand that they are involved with improves. And I believe that is something that we can build, build upon. Um, as the pensions minister, you would expect me to laud uh, automatic enrollment, because alongside reforms to the state pension, automatic enrollment into the workplace has been introduced to encourage more people to save for their retirement and to make saving normal for most people in work. Aside from the 9.5 million employees, as I mentioned earlier, we have gained the greatest ground on participation amongst younger workers and low earners. I'm not going to blind you with statistics, but there's a few that I want you to take away with you. In 2012, 65% of women employed full-time in the private sector did not have a workplace pension. By 2016, uh, this had uh, fallen down to 31%. Amongst eligible employees in the private sector, the workplace pension participation for women and men is now equal at 73%. Young people are also embracing pension saving, and almost 7 in 10 eligible 22 to 29-year-olds working in the private sector are now enrolled in a workplace pension. And that automatic enrollment has reversed the previous decade-long de decline in workplace pension saving, changing the culture of saving and normalizing savings on an ongoing basis. And 78% of employers, employees agree that it is normal for me to save into a workplace pension, with 80% stating that Overall, it is worthwhile for me to do that. Now, I want to make the point that this is not possible 
in relation to automatic enrollment without the amazing work of the actual employers themselves. There is 1.1 million employers across the UK who have played a vital role in making sure that so many workers are now saving into a workplace pension. And the attitude of the employers themselves towards workplace pensions can have a positive, supported influence on their workers' participation. There is a variety of research which uh, sets out the views of different groups of employers about pensions. In July 2017, a survey of 800 small to medium employers conducted by the uh, pensions regulator found that a clear majority of employers continued to believe that the introduction of automatic enrollment was a, both a good idea for them and their members of staff. In 2015, the CBI and Mercer, who I know are here today, interviewed over 160 companies looking at the case for pensions more generally. 96% agreed that there was a good business case for employers providing pensions. 92% said that providing pensions helped recruit and then motivate and retain staff. And 88% said it enhanced corporate reputation. Now, I'm always keen to hear more from the likes of yourselves about how that, that you feel that, that is working. We conducted a 2017 review of automatic enrollment, and we want to build a sense of personal ownership of workplace pension saving amongst individuals. I note that there are a number of sessions later today on financial well-being and communication, and I will be very interested to hear your ideas. I've met some of the organizations earlier today. Uh, and surely this is what this conference is about. In essence, I believe what we're talking about here is responsible capitalism making sure that your employees and the wider public have faith in the market, in capitalism, and the companies they work for. I'm interested in the uh, Charles Cameron seminar on how we structure pay and employee benefits to ensure access to the housing market. I I've been meeting with the likes of Moneybox, Plum, and others, uh, and other fintech companies who are providing the alternative saving products that are going to be discussed in the Smartly Roundtable later on. And I'll be certainly staying to try and see if I can listen to some of the good ideas that you have going forward. Now, I, I want to try and address how we are uh, rethinking rewards and benefits for a changing workforce. Because I believe wholeheartedly in what increasingly is known as the midlife MOT. Uh, if you, like me, are now sufficiently old that your uh, doctor is beginning to send you texts pointing out that various bits of your anatomy are going to fail shortly, and that really you should engage and have some preemptive checks, then you will know that the Department of Health is taking things quite seriously in terms of these matters. If uh, your dentist regularly texts you to point out that you haven't uh, attended for over a year, and basically if you fail to do this, your teeth will ultimately fall out, uh, not quite that draconian, I accept, but then you know that you're in a position that the, uh, the health service is looking at things in a very different way. We don't really do this for finances. The midlife MOT, however, in my view, is a uh, groundbreaking way forward, uh, which could provide a review that would help individuals to understand their options in terms of job and career change, their training, their finances, their flexible working, and their long-term prospects leading up to retirement. It helps people to plan financially for the future, and we at the Department of Work and Pensions are working with a range of employers to build the evidence base to understand, scope, and assess user demand. Then my own department will be pioneering the MOT with its staff and building on the existing employee assistance program. I'd be interested, extremely interested, in examples that you have from your particular businesses uh, where you have workplaces that are engaging in a different way. There are a variety of options going forward, and clearly on a midlife MOT, there is uh, a particular point. Uh, I'm reliably informed uh, by my Australian colleagues who hold my position that it's exactly at the age of 47 that we uh, all start determining what we're going to do in a longer term. It's not at 50, it's not at 45, but approximately 47 is when suddenly you begin to assess your own mortality and look forward and make uh, views and uh, assessments of what's going ahead. But there are other key strategic points of our working life that clearly this applies, whether it is having a baby, whether it is buying a house or promotion or changing jobs. But what we're trying to do also is to harness uh, technology to do things in a different way. We are developing and testing 
targeted interventions to identify the most effective options to increase savings amongst self-employed. Uh, we recently hosted an innovation event uh, with the ABI and uh, uh, Her Majesty's Treasury to explore the role of technology in enabling self-employed people to build retirement savings for their later life. There are in excess of four million self-employed people. That is growing. It's not just the gig economy delivering your food at night. It is all manner of different uh, employees. And how we have them saving on an ongoing basis is going to be one of the great challenges. Uh, any help you can give, we're very interested to know. Uh, an example of what we're trying to work for is, is the uh, Sidecar Savings Project, which is academic research pioneered by Harvard University, looking at how people behave and giving the option of having a liquid savings product alongside their workplace pension. The intention is this it might be a way of giving people the financial resilience to cope with the financial shocks that can affect them at any stage in their lives. Harvard is partnering with a variety of employers already using the Nest Pension Scheme and a provider of liquid savings products suitable to act as the sidecar. The research should be completed by 2020 and will be published, and we are looking very strongly at how it is we can harness what the private sector is already doing. I'd like to finish on one key point, which is the uh, Fuller Working Lives strategy, because it is patently clear that there is a changing demographic in this country, uh, and that has a massive impact on the workplace and retirement. And I want to encourage you and your businesses to hire older workers. Over the 10 years between 2014 and 2024, the UK will have 200,000 fewer people aged 16 to 49, and yet 3.2 million more people aged 50 plus. You don't need me to explain the significance of the impact this will have on your business, uh, but the working demographic is changing dramatically. Life expectancy is going off the charts. The days of three score years and 10 are, are in no way reflected by today. If I had a daughter tomorrow, she would have an average life expectancy of 94, average. The um, next five years will see uh, one in three of the working age population will be age 50 or over. It is clear that you as businesses will need to draw on the knowledge, skills, and experience of these older workers, both to maintain competitiveness and avoid a skill and labor shortage. The good news is that uh, employment rates are at record levels. There are more people aged 50 years and over in employment than ever before. That's over 10 million workers in the UK. And our Fuller Working Life Strategy, published in 2017, adopts a new approach it is led by employers who rightly see themselves as the ones who understand the business case and can drive change. Business is in the driving seat when it comes to the uh, retention, the retraining, and the recruitment of older workers. And there are interesting examples uh, who are of employers who are already rising to the challenge and adopting business practices that support an inclusive and multi-generation approach. I could talk to you about multinationals like Aviva, who uh, are pioneering uh, this, but I, I want to talk to you about a, a, a very uh, traditional company called Steelite that I visited in Stoke, who are a pottery company, and they employ about 500 people creating pottery uh, in a very, very um, uh, blue-collar, muscle-bound job uh, in circumstances where this is not white-collar by any stretch of the imagination. I was absolutely struck when they informed me, and they're quite an elderly working population who are very traditional in the pottery business. And they, that business allows uh, its 500 employees to access an IFA on a regular basis who is pretty much full-time employed by uh, the business, having uh, an ability to go in and assist on an ongoing basis. I think there are dramatic changes and their HR director, who I met, said, we owe our success, obviously, to the quality of our workforce, but a key element of that is the diversity of age and experience we have within the business. We've asked uh, Andy Briggs to become the business champion for older workers, and they are spearheading the Fuller Working Lives agenda. We have a target to, to increase the number of older workers employed by this country uh, by 12% by 2022, this equates to a further 1 million people aged 50 and over. I believe it makes good sense for you, and it saves on recruitment costs, and it means you're, as an employer you don't lose the skills you invested in. I'd like to end by thanking Reba for inviting me to speak. 
I'm positive about the work that you are doing, but more importantly, what I'm really interested in is, if I was to return in one year's time, what would be the change in your business? I would love to come back and hear and understand and assess where all of you as companies have progressed. Because surely that is what today is genuinely about. It's not about how you are now, it's about where your company is going and how it measures up in 2019. You have my best wishes, and I hope that you can be all that you can be. Many thanks. Where would you like? Thank you very much, Guy. And um, we've got a, f a few minutes, I think, for sure. some Q&A. We're going to try not to keep it too political. We've had to filter out one or two questions. Um, um, <laughs> I don't want to take a view one way or the other. Let's try and keep it straight down the line. Um, but the first question coming up, government has now transferred pension responsibility to the employer. What else is in government going to um, require employers to pick up? Well, I think that the uh, auto-enrolment is something that has been... Uh, ongoing since uh, 2004, it, the law came in in 2012, and obviously that is an ongoing process, but I don't think there is um, uh, anything specifically that is going to be newly uh, put upon the individual employer. The, the point I make about the midlife MOT is that I don't regard that as something that is a new burden on the employer, because you are already doing uh, wellness assessments, you're already doing uh, annual reviews, what I want you to do, though, is I want you to try and engage with your individual employee to ask them where they feel they're going with their finances. Because, particularly, we're in the city of London. Many of the businesses here are financial services businesses. And the idea that your own staff are not aware of their own finances and not actually uh, being evaluated and being triggered and nudged and prompted, in my view, is something that is anathema. I find it bizarre that when we have... Uh, FTSE 100 companies who are advising individual organizations on uh, finances and advising all of us as to how we should save and do things, but aren't necessarily engaging with their staff in that way. That's the burden I want to do. I think you're doing it already. It's just a change of emphasis. Okay. Next very popular question. There will, the questions are coming up behind us. Okay. Um, if one in three are going to be 50 plus in the workplace, why are we so focused on millennials is it paternalism, trendy, or recognition of a different economy? I don't think we're not, I don't think we're focused on millennials. I think we're focused on all aspects of uh, society. But I think that there is a, a massive change in life expectancy. And that, the result of that is that you're going to have a workforce that is going to be a much older workforce. So it's not a question of um, being focused on one particular uh, sector of the economy or one particular age group. Just the factual reality is that the, your, your employees, uh, as a businesses, are going to be a lot older on an ongoing basis. And if you don't take, acknowledge that fact, which is unquestioned, you're going to be surprised in the years ahead. That's the key point. Then coming back to our poll earlier, you saw that one of the biggest impacts on pay budgets and stress among employees was housing costs. Yep. So given that housing costs are having such an impact on employees' finances, how can they save when they're struggling to find, to be able to afford their homes? Well, I think the, the key point is there is that they need to try and find a way in which to create a secondary savings product over and above, over and above automatic enrolment. I'm very, I don't want to particularly uh, endorse any one particular company, but uh, I'm massively impressed by organizations like Moneybox, by Plum, who are providing secondary saving products as you are working uh, and being able to get to, uh, get significant savings on an ongoing basis. That's also what we're trying to do with the Nest project, with Sidecar. There are a variety of ways which we're trying to do that. Obviously, there's the Lifetime ISO and various other ways as well. So building on that, next popular question, how would you suggest we encourage employees to save for the future when they can't afford to live today? Well, I think the evidence is pretty clear, actually. If you speak to Moneybox and you speak to other organizations, um, who are providing, some of them are here today, I know that some of them are actually going to be giving some of the seminars today, I had a chat mm. to them earlier on. The evidence is this, is that uh, the savings can be built up quite quickly, and the, uh, the, the, the I'll give you the, I'll, I'll, I'll endorse Moneybox to a degree, which, because it's a business I'm really interested in, and I think it's very impressive. If you're buying a cup of coffee, and it's then offering you to 
um, save the amount of, of, of change that you have, the ability to make savings on a significant basis as you're going forward is genuinely uh, game-changing. Plum are doing great work as well, CHIP and others are all other organizations. I think there are great capabilities to address the difficulties of savings, and there is no doubt that they are also much more accessible. Uh, no disrespect to the Hargreaves lands down of this world, but uh, they are not necessarily what the millennial generation are going to be engaging with. Uh, most people, you know, 50% of banking is going to be done on your phone within about two years. Uh, there's a dramatic change in the way in which financial services and uh, savings and banking is going to be done. Uh, and the way we do that is going to change too. Lovely. That's your last question. We're out of time. Thank you very much, Guy. Right. Thank, Thank you very for much. Coming today.